Well, we want to get right into the Word of God, so grab your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. I didn't know this uh, as I was preparing and just feeling led of the Lord. I did not know that this was men's month at GCI. I didn't know that. In fact, when I was fellowshipping with uh, G.O. yesterday, I had told him that I had a message uh, on my heart and uh, I wanted to deliver a message to the men. And then he said to me, you don't know this, but this month is our men's emphasis. So I took that as a confirmation that the Lord would want to bring a word to the men in our midst today. Do we have any men here today? I wonder, any men? The move? The move? The, a move? <laughs> I move. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're gonna, I want to talk to the men, but the ladies, I want you to listen. Because how many ladies are, are okay with me preaching to the men today? To encourage the men and to strengthen the men through the Word of God. So today I want to talk to you from the subject, Masculinity as God Designed It. Or another title could be, Be a Man. Tell somebody next to you, be a man. Now, if the person next to you is a sister, don't tell her, be a man. <laughs> tell the brother next to you, be a man. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, the days of David drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Everybody say, be a man. So God created mankind. In creating mankind, he created two sexes, male and female. First, there was male. God created a man. That man was a male, a masculine male. He had a male body, male physiology, male anatomy, with male DNA, XY chromosomes. He was a man, a masculine man that God created. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be masculine, to be a man as God designed men to be? That's what I want to talk about this morning for the next few minutes. But before I can explain what masculinity is as God intended, I need to first address what masculinity is not. Because there are lies circulating in our culture about men. And we need to expose these lies and shine the light of God's word upon them to help us understand the lie from the truth. The first lie, the first thing that masculinity is not is this. Masculinity is not toxic. Come on, everybody say it. Masculinity is not toxic. Because feminism today and woke ideology, would, 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 they've come up with this term, toxic masculinity. But from a biblical theological perspective, it is not masculinity that is toxic. It is humanity that can be toxic. It's what the Bible calls moral depravity. So if a man is toxic, and a man can be toxic, it is not his masculinity that's toxic. It is his depravity as a human being that is toxic. It's the same for women. How many know that a woman can be toxic? All of the men are being very quiet right now. They don't want to... They don't want to comment on that. But how many know that a woman can be toxic? Amen. It's true, right? If you encounter a woman who is toxic, we do not say that it's toxic femininity. We just simply say that's a toxic person. 
It's because they are human and they are depraved. Here's the problem with this, ta- this, this, this phrase, toxic masculinity. Labeling masculinity as toxic tells young men, it tells boys that there's something wrong with being a man. That being a man is bad. That you can't be trusted because you're a man. Because as a man, you're part of an oppressive patriarchy that victimizes women. It's telling men, you should deny your manhood and be more like a girl. Be more genteel. Be softer. More sensitive. Get in touch with your feminine side. But here's a word for the men. Do we have any men here today? A word for the young men, for the old men, for the boys that want to become men. God made you a man, so be a man. Come on, everybody say it. Be a man. Be sensitive, yes, but be assertive. Be kind, yes, but be bold. Be humble, but be strong. Be loving, but speak the truth. Be willing to yield, but then know also when to stand your ground. Be masculine. Be a man. It is not toxic to be a man. Amen. Tell your brother next to you, be a man. The second thing that masculinity is not, masculinity is not fluid. It is not fluid. Masculinity is not malleable. It is not a spectrum defined by varying degrees of gender. If you're a man, that is who God made you to be. You can't change the fact that you are a man and just decide one day that you're going to be a woman. You see, there's this ideology that's circulating today called transgenderism, where some men call themselves a woman and some women call themselves men. But I want us to understand, in the light of biblical revelation and theological truth, that there is no such thing as a trans man. A trans man is a woman who says she's a man. And there's no such thing as a trans woman, meaning a man who says he's a woman. A woman is a woman, and a man is a man. Period. Now, you can call yourself a woman. You can change your appearance, you can act like a woman, but if you have an XY chromosomes, you are a man. That is how God made you. Even Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. And to reject that gender identity that God assigned to you at conception, at your birth, is to reject God's authorship, and authority over your life. It is an act of rebellion against the Creator. So masculinity is not toxic. Masculinity is not fluid. And masculinity is not optional. Now, culture celebrates... Now, this is predominant in the United States, especially in New York, and I believe it's even making its way into East Africa by way of social media and the internet, culture celebrates being gender neutral, non-binary, with no biological or gender distinction. Young men are being told today, channel your inner female. If you feel effeminate and girly, then be effeminate and girly. If you want to be gay, be gay. If you want to wear a dress, put on makeup and change your name and act like a woman, then act like a woman. This is what society says. No one has the right to judge you. No one has the right to define you. No one has the right to tell you to be a man. But that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says, if you're a man, be a man. Come on, everybody say, be a man. Be a man. When we read there in 1 Kings chapter 2, David was on his deathbed, and he said to, to Solomon, he said, Son, I am about to die, and I have one last word for you. You were born a man. God made you a man. You have the physique of a man. So therefore, be strong and prove yourself a man. 
David did not say, now, son, let me just make sure, because I know you look like a man, but how do you feel? Do you feel like a man, or do you feel like a woman? Are you attracted to men, or are you attracted to women? Do you identify as a male, a female, non-binary, cisgender? What are your pronouns, Solomon? No. David said, boy, you are a man. You were born a man. You have the biology of a man. So act like a man, dress like a man, talk like a man, and be a man. Masculinity is not optional. Masculinity is not fluid. Masculinity is not toxic. So now that we've exposed some of the lies of our culture, and we know what masculinity is not, let me tell you what the Bible says about masculinity. First, when we look at Genesis 1.26, we see that masculinity is Christ-likeness. God said, let us make man in our image. You are created in the image of God. God wants to reflect his image in you. Now, as we know, Adam sinned. And the image of God in Adam and mankind has been marred. Moral depravity has entered humanity and corrupted us. But the good news is that Jesus came to deliver us from the power of sin and bring us back into right standing with God. So that now, through Jesus, we can demonstrate the image of God that was originally given to mankind in creation. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank God for Jesus. So when we say be a man, we are not saying be a tough guy and lift more weights and do more push-ups. No. When we say be a man, what we're saying is this. Be like Jesus. Because true biblical masculinity reflects the image of God through Jesus. So masculinity is Christ-likeness. Secondly, masculinity is responsibility. Everybody say responsibility. Adam was created to work. He was created to receive a job, an assignment, and be productive. Verse 28 says that God gave him this assignment, subdue the earth, take dominion over the animals, the fish, the birds, tend the garden and keep it. I'm giving you seed and soil. Make the ground productive. What does that mean? That means that as a man, we are to have responsibility. So first, as we look at Adam, what it means for us is that as men, it means get a job. Hello? <laughs> Tell the brother next to you, get a job. Get a job, work hard, and be productive. God has given you skills. He's given you talents. He's given you abilities. You need to discover what those competencies are that God has given you, and you need to become productive in this life and take responsibility for the masculinity that God has given you. Hallelujah. Secondly, to be responsible means to be a man of action. The definition of responsibility is taking ownership of whatever tasks need to be done. That's what a man does. A man does not say, well, that's not my job. A man does not walk away from difficult tasks and let other people do the hard work. A man does not make his wife do all of the work. Real men wash dishes. <laughs> Only the sisters are getting blessed right now. The men are looking at me like they want to take me out behind the church and beat me up. But I'm going to say it again. Real men wash dishes. <laughs> you know what else real men do? Real men change diapers. I hear a lot of female amens there. I don't hear many...
Can I hear some brothers say amen? amen. Real men change diapers. Real men do dishes. Real men use the broom and sweep the floor. My wife told me, she said, she said, Greg, you never look more attractive to me than when you're using the broom and sweeping the floor. So now we have the cleanest floors in all of New York. Being a man of action, amen. Hallelujah. So true masculinity is Christ's likeness. It's responsibility. And we also see that biblical masculinity is self-mastery through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Genesis 2.17, God told Adam, do not eat the fruit of the tree. He was telling Adam, there's going to be something in the garden that's going to be attractive to you. Something in the garden that's going to stir up and provoke a desire in you. And God was telling Adam that if you have this impulse to go to the tree and eat the fruit, you need to command that impulse into submission and take authority over your flesh and exercise self-mastery. This is what it means to be a man. Being a man means that we don't act on our immediate impulses. It means being a man doesn't mean that you have the right to do whatever you want to do and say whatever you want to say and just feel however you want to feel. Being a man doesn't mean that because you're a man, you have the right to be a bully and intimidating or aggressive or violent or become physical against your wife. Being a man is not something that we see on television. On television, we see this, this hyper-masculinity, loud and proud and aggressive and violent. That's not masculinity as God defines it. That's masculinity out of control. That's moral depravity. That's corrupting masculinity. True masculinity is a man who has brought his flesh, his anger, his pride, his aggression under control. In 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul said, I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. So masculinity is Christ-likeness. It's responsibility. It's self-mastery. And masculinity is also strength. Can you say strength? David told Solomon, be strong and prove yourself a man through that strength. Now some of us, when we hear that, we think that this command to be strong is all about physical strength and big muscles. And so a lot of men will go to the gym and they'll do resistance training and cardio and they'll bulk up and, and they'll, they'll eat protein and they'll set goals to bench 300 pounds or power clean 600 pounds thinking that a well-defined abdominal muscles will make us more manly and big biceps and pectorals will make us more masculine. But listen, when David told Solomon, be strong and prove yourself a man, he wasn't talking about physical power he was talking about inner fortitude. He was talking about resilience and grit. He was talking about character. So being strong as a man has little to do with how much you can bench press or power clean or how many goals you can score on the, on the football field. Being strong as a man is about inner strength. It's about a sense of responsibility, a capacity to endure, to persevere, to stay in your place and be faithful, even though you've been offended, even though there's adversity, even though there's resistance, that because you're a man, you're strong, you stand your ground, you hold your place, you won't be chased away, you won't give up, you won't run out, you won't leave the church, you'll stand at your post and stay in your place and do what you've been assigned to do because you're a man and you're strong. You see, without that kind of power, that inner strength, that inner fortitude, muscles don't really matter. Because you can be the strongest male in the room, but at the same time be the weakest man in the room. Those two things can be true at the same time. I'll say it again. You can be the strongest male 
in the room with all the biceps and the pecs and the abdomen. You can be the strongest male in the room, but at the same time be the weakest man. I've known some pretty powerful, muscular guys who were strong on the outside, but weak on the inside. Their ego was frail. Their character was feeble. Their integrity was soft. Sure, they could bench press and do push-ups and do well on the athletic field, but they were powerless against pornography. Powerless against alcohol and drugs. Powerless before anger and lust and insecurity and easily offended and run away when somebody said the wrong thing to them and easily discouraged because there was adversity or resistance. Oh, sure, they got muscles, but the muscles is not what makes them. In fact, what we, we call those kind of muscles just pretty muscles. You hear what I'm saying? There's a lot of men, they have pretty muscles, but they're not strong. True strength is not defined by pretty muscles. It's defined by inner fortitude. Ask the, ask the brother next to you, are you pretty or are you strong? Go ahead, ask him. Are you pretty or are you strong? Here's the remedy to weakness. Be a man. Be a man. Put as much energy into building your spirit and shaping your character as you do lifting weights in the gym. I'm not against the gym. I think it's important for us to take care of ourselves physically, especially as we age. We need to take care of our, our, our temples. Amen? Amen? There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to put as much emphasis, if not more emphasis, on our spiritual man as we do on our physical man. We need to study God's Word and get filled with the Spirit and spend time in prayer and get godly wisdom and discover what it means to be an overcomer rather than being a man who's easily overcome. So masculinity is Christ-likeness. It's responsibility. It's self mastery, its strength, and also masculinity leads to fatherhood. Genesis 1.28, God said to Adam and Eve, he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4, it says, fathers, bring your children up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, let me be clear here. This is not to say that in order to be a man, you have to have children. That's not what I'm saying. What it does mean is this. If you do have children, being a man means being a good father to those children. In the United States, it's a very sad statistic that one out of every four children live without a father in the home. One out of every four children are growing up without a father present in their life. Let's be clear. Being a biological dad does not make one a father. When God told Adam to be fruitful and multiply, that does not mean get with as many women as you can and make babies with them. That's not what God was saying. He was calling Adam into marriage. And in the context of marriage, he told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and have lots of kids. So that brings us to fatherhood. Because for many of us in this room, we can't really talk about masculinity without addressing fatherhood. So what is biblical fatherhood? Let me give you a couple points on this and then we'll pray and, and we'll be done. Number one, fatherhood is the example of masculinity. It is the example of Christ-likeness, self-mastery, responsibility, and strength of character. In other words, our sons should look at us and see what being masculine is all about. Our daughters should look at us and see what kind of a man is worth being with. 
that they should see in us, in their father, the kind of man that one day they'll want to marry. Amen. And let me just say something to the single sisters that are here today. Just because some guy is handsome and muscular and popular and sends you lo lovely text messages does not mean he's a man. Amen? A real man is Christ-like, self-controlled, responsible, has strong character, and can lead his family. Which is the second point about fatherhood. Fatherhood leads his family in godliness. That's what a father does. He leads his family in godliness. Ephesians 5 and 6, chapters 5 and 6, gives a twofold description of what the father does in the home. First, he loves his wife as Christ loves the church. And second, he trains his children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It's not that complicated. It's pretty simple. A father, a biblical father, leads his family. He leads his children in prayer. Dads, we have to pray with our kids. That's not, that's not the, the wife's job. It's not the mother's job. It's the father's responsibility. Remember, masculinity is responsibility. Amen? We shouldn't push that sacred duty off to the wife. Our children need to see us as fathers. The kids need to see their dads reading the Bible. They need to see their dads in the home, sitting in the chair with the Bible open on his lap, reading Scripture, memorizing Scripture. They need to hear their father quoting the Word of God. They need their father to give them a biblical framework through which they can view the confusion and chaos of this world. Children need to see their father in church. Fathers, men, it's not the wife's job to take the kids to church. We can't say, well, that's a woman's thing. They take. No, it's the father's duty. It's the man's duty to march their children to church. And the children need to see the father in the sanctuary with his hands lifted up, worshiping his Lord and his Savior. The children need to see that their father loves Jesus unashamedly and love your wife the women can say amen that's okay and love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself the best things that the best thing that you can do for your children is love and honor their mother amen treat her like the queen that she is she is the queen of your home. Hallelujah. The only queen. Come on, everybody say the only queen. Which means you're not supposed to have any princesses in the side anywhere. You only have one queen. That beautiful queen that God has blessed you with. You need to honor your queen and love your queen. It's one of the greatest things that you can do. To let your children see the stability and the security in the home because they see how their father treats their mother like a queen. Hallelujah. Do good things for her. Do nice things for her. Be kind. Be kind to her. Open the door for her. The Holy Ghost has fallen on the women over here. It's just something that I like to do for my wife. I like to open the door for my wife. When we go to the car, I follow her around to the passenger side, open the door for her, help her in, shut the door. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think we need a revival of door opening in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. We had some friends from, uh, from East Africa that were visiting, and they, they saw me 
you know, opening the door for my wife again and again and again. And they, and they said, that's so interesting. They said in Kenya, <laughs> the only time a man opens the car door for his wife is if he has a new car door, a new car or a new wife. <laughs> Love your wife. So if a father is an example, a father leads his family, and a father provides and protects. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says, If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Understand something. Being a provider and a protector is not just giving them food and shelter and, and clothes on their back. It's about providing an infrastructure within their lives, within the family, that is safe and secure and stable. That the father is the engineer of the home. That the father ensures that there is an infrastructure of stability and safety for the children and the family. Now, some men think, well, I work 75 hours a week. I'm providing, I'm paying the bills, I'm putting a roof over their head, food on the table, clothes on their back. But a provider does more than just bring money home. That's good and that's necessary. Amen. But it's about maintaining an environment of safety and security for a family to thrive in a world that is trying to pull the family apart. The devil hates families, and he's attacking families and marriages and children, and it's up to the father. If there's conflict in the marriage, it's up to the father, the husband, to say, my dear, I love you, and I'm committed to this marriage, and I will do whatever it takes to save this marriage and keep this family together. That's leadership. That's masculinity in the home. So yes, you are a breadwinner. And that's commendable. But you also need to love and nurture your queen. Yes, you are paying the bills. And that's commendable. But you need to be a voice of empowerment and affirmation to your kids. Yes, you are a provider. But you need to protect and insulate your family from the destructive forces of this world that are trying to corrupt and pollute and infect your children. What forces, you ask? Forces like the internet and social media and Netflix and YouTube. We need to make sure that we are not opening a portal for the powers of darkness to flood our homes through the ungodliness of this world to get a hold of the hearts and the minds and the affections of our children. As fathers, we need to be providers and protectors. Amen? Amen? So a father is an example. A father leads his family. A father provides and protects. And then a father gives discipline and correction. Hebrews 12.7 says, What son is there among you whom a father does not chasten? If you are not actively teaching your children right from wrong, you're not doing your job. So in the U.S., we have public schools that are funded by the state, and most families use the public schools that are funded. And generally, they're, they're very good, academically speaking. But lately, culture has become so rotten in the United States that the public schools have been taken over by homosexuality and transgenderism. And teachers now are trying to corrupt the minds of children with those messages. And so parents need to be, especially fathers, need to be actively engaged in what is going on in the lives of their kids. And at the very least, they need to be having conversations with their children, opening the Word of God and exposing the lies of the world. And in many cases, they have to remove their children from the schools and simply train them on their own. This is what's happening in the U.S., especially in New York. 
Society and culture is actively undermining the authority of parents. Even to the extent now that if a child, if a young child expresses any hint of gender confusion, the teachers in the school will begin to affirm the opposite gender in that child, allowing that little boy to give himself a girl's name and start to use girl's pronouns. And the school is not obligated to tell the parents. And parents are discovering that their child has, has assumed a whole different gender in the school and didn't even know it. And now legislation is taking place in various states in the U.S. where if a parent does not affirm the transgender preference of their little child, the state will have the authority to remove the child from the parents and give that child to an agency that will affirm that gender. This is what's happening in the U.S. And this is a major issue in our election right now where one of the candidates is, is very vocally in support of this. And it's up to the parents, especially the fathers, to be tuned in to what's happening in the lives of their kids and to teach them the truth from the lie. And the fathers that fail to do this are losing their children. And it's happening in the church. It's happening to pastors. It's happening. And you know what happens in the U.S. gets export, ex, exported all over the world. Amen. It's up to the fathers to train their children. Did you know that the prefrontal cortex of a child is not fully developed until they're 25, at least 25 years old? The frontal cortex of the brain is that part of the brain that is responsible for consequential thinking. It's able to process the outcomes of decisions or actions that are being taken. As adults, we have consequential thinking. We know that if we do this, that will happen. Children don't have that. That's why the Bible says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. The parents are the source of consequential thinking in the child's life. We are the self-control that a child does not have. And we need to have authority and control over the lives of our kids. That's the biblical model, and that's the role of the father. How many are getting this today? Amen? So a father leads his family, provides and protects, gives discipline and correction, and then finally, fatherhood builds a legacy. Amen? Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and evermore. Hallelujah. What does that mean? That means that we want our children and our children's children and our children's children's children to the third and fourth generation to look back at us as though we are spiritual legends. That's what it means to leave a legacy, that we make such a mark, we have such an imprint on our family, on our children, that they look back at us with admiration and they tell stories about our faithfulness and how we served God and how we impacted this world by being faithful to the call of Jesus Christ upon our lives. That's what I want. I want my children's children's children to the third and fourth and fifth and sixth generation to know my name and to know that I love Jesus Christ and served him faithfully. I want to leave a legacy to my kids. How about you, dads? Amen? I want to ask all the men, all the men to stand. All the men to stand. Just the men, not the ladies. All the men. I want to pray for you, and I want to pray that God will strengthen our resolve to be a masculine man the way that God created us to be. So, Father, I thank you for these men, these men of Gospel Center International Central Church. 
Lord, I want to pray, God, that your presence will be strong in each of their lives. Lord, that these men will be faithful, that they will be Christ-like, that they will be responsible, that they will exercise self-mastery, that they will have true strength, inner fortitude and resilience, and that those that are fathers, that, Lord, they would be faithful fathers. Lord, let the blessing of the Lord be upon this church and the men of this church, and let us be masculine men according to the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. amen. Let's give the Lord, let's give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Amen.